So, Tom Webster, you didn't have time to prep with me. Been so busy. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. It's probably 55% lack of time, 45% lazy. But it, it just tips into the balance of being busy, I think. Okay. I won't personalize it, but we agreed to wing it. We did. Yeah. That'll be easy for you. You're like the go-to guy for all things research. You're the SVP of Edison Research, and you're a regular keynoter and a webinar genius. Well, now maybe a Zoom pro. And we've had a bunch of conversations before. Mm. Yep. We have, yeah. And now we're we're living our lives on Zoom, so we've all had to get weird <laughs> on it. Yeah, exactly. But you're wearing the Edison Research hat, so you're still a company man. I am a company man. Actually, uh, Larry Rosen, our president, just sent me this hat. I got it in the mail yesterday. But... You've been there 16 years. I have been there 16 <laughs> it years. It took him a yes, while. I yeah, I've been there 16 years, and this is the gift. 16 years, you get a hat. Uh, I'm hoping at year 25, it's a shirt, and then we'll we'll move up from there. Okay. All right, Tom, I'm going to talk about you by talking about your wife. You're married to a very well-respected marketing advisor. She is also a great keynoter, Tamsin mm-hmm. Webster. And she has a weekly video called Find the Red Thread about mastering change. And her last one was about how to explain your idea in 30 seconds. So since we didn't prep, I'm going to ask you to explain who you are in 30 seconds or less. I'm going to do it in less. I tell the <laughs> stories of numbers and try to, you know, I, I work with Edison on a lot of data projects. And it's my job to make sure that people understand the context and the meaning of what it is that we do. That was great. What about you, the person? I am only my job, BB. I, <laughs> I am we're, only we're my gonna, job. We're going to suss that out a little bit. I'm E.B. Moss, and this is episode 16 of Insider Interviews, and I am with the peripatetic and poetic Tom Webster of Edison Research. And we're going to hear more about what Edison Research does And I'm definitely going to pull out a little bit more about what Tom does and who he is, because there's a lot more than meets the ear. Peripatetic. That's a good one. That's a good (laughs) one. I haven't been peripatetating a lot lately because of, you know, gestures broadly at outside world. Yes. But uh, peripatetic is a good word. Yeah, I like it. And I know a little something about you, too, which is uh, you've got a background in English lit. Were you an instructor or just a major? Yeah, no, I, uh, I I was sort of full bore into this. I got a bachelor's in English from Tufts and then a master's at Penn State. And I taught freshman rhetoric and composition at Penn State for a couple of years. And then I came to the realization of just how much I liked money and how <laughs> little of it I had. So I... I decided the academic life, at least in that setting, was was not for me. So I, I ventured a fourth into the career that I have now, which is which has been a pretty good one. Yeah. Well, and you've done so many different things lately to uh, be additive to what you've been doing with Edison Research. And I thought that this was like a really good lead in and it touches on your expertise with words. So you have a new newsletter along with many others who are taking advantage of things like Substack. And you'll tell us about that. But in one of your recent essays, you wrote about the Q2 research that you'd done on podcasting with Edison Research and about how Joe Rogan, who pretty much anyone listening to this podcast probably has heard of, you said, remains a massive outlier. You talked about the size of the Joe Rogan experience being like almost like having the Super Bowl size of an audience every single week. And you said, speculating what happens to that audience once JRE is exclusive to Spotify is beyond my ken. So that speaks to three things. You have a newsletter I want to hear about. It's an interesting factoid about the state of podcasting, and I want you to go into that. Mm -hmm. And I also don't know anyone else who would use Beyond My Ken or yeah, anyone else who really would you know what that is. Named Ken, who's not very smart. <laughs> so discuss. <laughs> discuss. All right. Well, I think we've dealt with Beyond My Ken. Yeah. So on sort of backing up into the Joe Rogan experience, you know, for the last four quarters, 
we have uh, fielded a, a, you know, a massive study called the Podcast Consumer Tracker, where we are getting thousands of weekly podcast listeners basically writing in, in their own words, all the shows that they've listened to in the last week. And then we hand code that in a huge, just kind of brute force effort. And every quarter of those four quarters, the Joe Rogan show has not only been the number one podcast, it hasn't been even remotely close. And in fact, because he's currently an independent, he is classed as his own network. And when we look at our network ranker, you do not have to go very far down from number one to find Joe Rogan. Uh, I'll just wow. leave it at that. And, you know, in some ways, you know, good for Joe. Joe is very talented. He does not, I don't think, get enough credit for how talented he really is as an interviewer because he is able to sustain in-depth conversations with complicated people about complicated topics for hours. And he's extremely good at that. But it's also a bit of a cry for help. Joe is uniquely talented, but I don't think he's the only person who can aggregate an audience like that, but currently he is. So I still think podcasting is just, you know, if it's a journey, it's just pulling out of the driveway. We ought to have a lot more Joe Rogans appealing to different slices of, of humanity. And, you know, there are some big shows, don't get me wrong, but Rogan's still an outlier. Hmm. And so with the world of podcasting in general. Tell me about Edison's focus on research about audio and what else you cover. Yeah. So, you know, we have a, a number of sort of central business units at Edison. The thing that we're best known for in the non-audio world is as the sole providers of exit polling data and vote count data for the national election pool. So this November, when you're watching all the election coverage on TV on election night and the various networks talk about vote count coming in or exit poll data, that actually all comes from us. Wow. And yeah, a lot of people don't know that. It's incredibly intricate, complicated work. And so that's why I work on audio and I work on the audio side of our business. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we started really as a radio research company back in 1994 and we have branched into really every form of audio. I am very fortunate to do work on podcasts, on streaming audio, on audiobooks. And, you know, just uh, if I were a little boy right now, considering a career in digital audio, I would want to work with everybody that I'm currently working with. So I, I, it's just a, a fantastic situation and uh, really privileged to be able to serve multiple industries within the kind of umbrella of audio. And I felt very privileged to even be on the same stage as you. We were on what I think is maybe the last and first session all about voice hmm. at CES in January, right before everything kind of shut down. So you're, you're quite involved and quite knowledgeable in the world of voice, too. How do you describe how we refer to voice, what that means versus audio? Yeah. So when, when we think about voice, at least internally at Edison, we think about smart audio. And I think for a lot of people, that's smart speakers. And, you know, we've, we've had a partnership with NPR for the last four years called the Smart Audio Report. And that's predominantly been focused on smart speakers like the Amazon, you know, I'm not going to say her name because she's right here, but yes. you know who I'm talking about. Yes, uh, I do. And, and she's Home. listening. And, She's listening to every word of this and, and is extracting money from my uh, bank account as we speak. <laughs> but it's more than the smart speaker. And I think as the years go by, you know, smart audio is really the term that, that we like to adopt. And it, it refers to voice assistant technology of all kinds. But I think right now people think of it as sort of confined to a gadget. But at some point, I think it's just going to be transparent and a part of our everyday life. It's going to be baked into your car. It's going to be baked into your fridge. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to just ask your fridge is the milk still good? And the fridge <laughs> says, no, don't drink that. Milk. <laughs> you know, and that sort of everyday utility is when the technology disappears and it's just, are they useful to us? Well, it's interesting because I think the uh, example of if you ran out of milk is, is the classic one with IOT, the internet of things yeah. and voice technology. It's sort of like how we used to describe being able to order things from our TV as now you can buy Jennifer Aniston sweater <laughs> right. while you were right. watching yeah. friends. Or so after watching you... a De Beers commercial, would you like to buy a three carat dime? Yeah, sure. hundred <laughs> percent. PayPal, please. PayPal. 
how rapid is the progress? I'll ask it that way in terms of uptake of voice and enabled devices. What do you, you see? Know, there's two stories here, I think, in, on, on parallel tracks. Number one is the growth of smart speakers, which in their first three years grew faster than any technology that we've tracked. You know, we have a uh, an annual kind of flagship study called the Infinite Dial that we've done since 1998. And I've worked on it since 2004. And of all the things that we've tracked, you know, podcasting, smart speakers, uh, you know, different technologies, smart speakers grew the fastest. So on the one hand, A, that's significant. On the other hand, the technology that powers these things is on your phone already, and it's been on your phone for years. And a lot of people just don't use it on their phone. And we have seen in our research that it's actually taken the smart speaker, the kind of unitasker of voice tech, to train people. Almost like a, It's almost like the Trojan horse of voice assistant technology to then start using it on their phone. So to me, you know, the killer app for voice assistant technology, it's already in your pocket and you've already gotten it. It's just a question of, will you get that habit or not? Well, speaking of phones and them being adapted to different use cases, where are we, or is it moot with FM chip insertion in mobile phones? Yeah, I I don't, I think that's kind of moot, to be honest with you, because it's not a consumer driven technology. I haven't seen evidence that there's a hue and cry amongst consumers for that. Consumers are, uh, you know, there are, are plenty of apps out there besides individual radio station apps. iHeart has an app. TuneIn is a very popular app. People know how to get radio stations on their phone if they want. We've done research that shows that people don't necessarily have significant concerns about bandwidth and things like that. Data is very cheap right now. So, you know, to my mind, getting a chip to get broadcast over the air radio in your phone. It's, I don't think it's something consumers are clamoring for. And how about radio in general? You know, there's been so much talk and there are quite a few different studies that talk about its ongoing popularity. And many will say it's still at 91% of Hmm. usage. And, and yet the other factions will talk about the hit it took during our current pandemic. Tell me, a research guru. Well, it does continue to enjoy significant reach. And, you know, that that sort of 90, 91% figure, I believe that's weekly amongst people who agree to participate in radio ratings. Mm. Uh, and so there's, I think there may be a, a factor involved in that. We've done a study every quarter called Share of Year that we've done since 2014. And in that we track daily reach and daily usage of all audio online and offline. And, you know, for that, the kind of daily reach of radio for us is really about the two thirds mark in general. And so is it 90 daily? No, but is it a lot? And does it continue to have the largest reach of any audio platform? Of course it does. The one thing that I think has changed has been the time spent listening, but it's not necessarily that there's been this, you know, huge, falling off of a cliff of people abandoning radio, but streaming, podcasting, satellite radio, all of these things have have cut into radio's share of listening, but radio remains the plurality of listening. That's interesting. And I think people don't really understand the reach and the enormity still of radio, even if it has taken a little bit of a downward curve. Talk to us about the uptake in podcasting then conversely. Yeah. So podcasting, and again, in our share of ear research has gone up about two and a half times what it was back in 2014 when we started. The way I like to express it is this. When we first started tracking podcasting and share of ear, it was at about 2% of all audio listening. That's not 2% of humans. That's 2% of all the hours that we spend listening to audio every day. So back in 2014, uh, 2% was spent with podcasting. And I think radio was was about 54%, I think, something like that. So the ratio of podcasting to radio in terms of share was 1 to 26. <laughs> Today, podcasting is at 5, and you know, radio is in the, in the low 40s. And so that's closer to about a 1 to 8 ratio. So in that period of time, it's gone from 1 26th of radio to about an eighth, a ninth or an eighth of radio. And that ain't nothing. 
you know, and I, I think podcasters would love to be billing an eighth or a ninth of what the radio industry is billing right now. And, you know, hang tight. Yeah. And, and I failed math, but I know even from hearing those fractions that that's pretty good. I also remember in 2014, I was working at Ad Large, which is mm -hmm. an audio rep firm, and, and they're the proud rep of top five podcasts, I think, Crime Junkies. Not a commercial for them, but they're they're still friends, and, and I adore them. And I remember gathering around in the conference room when the Share of Year report was going to be broadcast or, or on mm -hmm. a webinar. That was pre-Zoom. And we were all leaning in to hear about share of ear, but you have other reports. Can you talk about the high profile ones that you regularly put out there? I know you do one of them with John Rosso from Triton Digital, mm -hmm. yep. my other old boss. <laughs> <laughs> I get around. Uh, love John. And yes, John and I do. just have a great relationship and rapport and have been able to do our annual Infinite Dial webinar, which uh, which we've really ramped up in terms of production with, with video and everything else as, as a live event. So that's uh, Infinite Dial is, is in partnership with Triton Digital. Share of Ear is our quarterly look at all audio online and offline. The podcast Consumer Tracker is another subscription product, but we do release occasionally things like uh, we just released a top 30 podcasts for a one-year period. And that's a big quarterly sort of massive diary project. I mentioned the Smart Audio Report with NPR. We do another project with NPR called the Spoken Word Audio Report. And that's really a look at all of the things that, that are that are talky talky on uh, out there. And that includes audiobooks, that includes podcasts. Um, and you know, the share of ear for spoken word audio in general versus music has gone up by 20% in just a couple of years. And podcasting's had a lot to do with that. There's also been a real surge in audiobooks. Audiobooks are hotter than ever. So there's there's really a, a renaissance or a renaissance, if you will, of <laughs> That's spoken beyond word my audio. Ken. That's beyond your Ken. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I warned you about Ken. <laughs> so spoken word audio is hot right now. And we've, you know, we've been fortunate to track that. Well, I promised that we were winging this, but you did tee me up beautifully because your predecessor podcast episode of Insider Interviews was with Michael Smith, the CMO of NPR. And Michael oh, talked great. a lot. Yeah. Michael talked a lot about diverse voices and even diversity within the halls of NPR itself. And I know that there's been sort of some ups and downs with the diversity of podcast listeners and also podcast content. And for a while, it looked like the percentage of African-American listeners had ticked up. And then it looked like white listeners was back, you know, taking more of the, the brass ring. So where are we, Tom, and how can we step up our game? Yeah, and a lot of it really does come down to investment you know, investment in content, investment in marketing that content. The audiences uh, are there. The audiences are significant. And yeah, things did tick a little bit wider again in podcasting, but not, I wouldn't say the amount that it ticked was alarming. That it did tick a little bit wider is, is, is somewhat alarming. But, you know, podcasting is a wonderfully big, diverse tent. And we, in fact, at Edison, we just about a month ago put out our very first Latino podcast listener study which we did in partnership with uh, a number of, of brands, actually. Uh, NPR Including being yeah, yet NPR. another interviewee, Juleka Lentigua-Williams. Juleka Lentigua-Williams, <laughs> yes. Uh, he was a partner. Adande Media was a partner. Pandora was a partner. And Libsyn was a partner. So we had a lot of great entities looking to put that out because, you know, it's just a, it's a fact of life about the media is if you don't measure it, it's not there. Mm. Uh, of course, it's there. But if you measure it, then you give voice to it, you give value to it, and that creates investment. And so, you know, I'd like to believe that the role that we had in podcasting way back in 2005, 2006, provided a foundation for people to feel secure in investing in it because they could rely on those numbers every year. And, and you know, that's been, I, I'd like to think, a part of the growth in podcasting's revenue up till now. Tom, we talked at the beginning of the show about how you have put out your own newsletter and 
we mentioned how your wife has a regular video series and also a, a, a terrific blog. Do we still call them blogs? I think so. But you're somebody who has embraced multi-platform exposure for your own brand and certainly for what you put out for Edison Research. Are there any best practices that you can talk about and what's helping grow a particular podcast, a particular audio program? Mm. What do you recommend and what you've observed? Yeah, I mean, the, the have a, having a distinctive voice is a is a really big part of that. You know, I I have a lot of friends who do interview shows. You know, the kind of banter casts where you get a couple people back and forth, and maybe they interview somebody. And it's a really hard skill, right? Like you're good at it, Evie, but most people are not good at it. Thank you. And there's a real sort of Lake Wobegon effect for you know. For people thinking that they're better at this than others it's honestly why i don't do an interview podcast because i i respect the skill of those who are great at it way too much to unleash my particular brand of mediocrity on the world <laughs> so it's very hard to be a good interviewer and so really the question is what is your unique distinctive point of view what is your unique distinctive point of view and uh, i'm very grateful for the career i've had at edison because on the one hand i get to represent all of the fine work done by the in incredibly detail-oriented people at Edison and the work that we do together. And that's re and I represent that in, you know, in a way that's, I think, congruent with me, but congruent with, with Edison. Uh, and then I started the newsletter really as a way to, to continue to have my own distinctive point of view, which Edison also values. And, you know, right from the get-go, uh, Larry is our president and just a great mentor and friend has been encouraging of that because it, you know, People don't want to listen to something that is not distinctive and unique and a, and, a, and a strong point of view. So, you know, if having something to say is one of the most important aspects of having a podcast. But I'll also compliment you on the way you say things. And, and you do have a, a great brand and, and a, a great ability to work a turn of phrase. And I think this is what I preach a lot also, that the brand of the individual executives is really important to put out there in compelling content. So Edison Research hats off. <laughs> well, to and you. and also, you know, for anybody, we've been doing a, a, a webinar every other week, all summer long and really all throughout the pandemic. You know, as as events were taken away, we we made up our mind to to, you know, to plant a flag for quality, at least, you know, bi-weekly and have our own event. Most of those have not been done by me. We have uh, an incredible team of talented people at Edison incredible team of talented women, frankly, that just just all throughout the pandemic have been putting out great stuff about Gen Z with radio, putting out uh, just uh, some great podcast research, putting out, um, you know, election research and, and things like that that we have done. So by far, I am not the only representative out there for, for Edison. We have a, a, a culture that encourages development and encourages having a voice. And, and it's been extremely valuable for us. Well, I think the best part for me is that you make research consumable, understandable. And again, I'm I'm going to compliment your brand of presenting it. You know, you are a draw at every event, whether it's virtual or in person long ago. And so I think I'm it's forward. the way you present it. <laughs> yes. Um, and I love reading your newsletter. Do you want to give us a little uh, plug for that? Yeah. And that, you know, I have a newsletter. It's at tomwebster.substack.com and it's called I Hear Things. And it's it's mostly about podcasting, but it stretches out into, you know, the, the broader world of audio and even some personal things. I, I know I, I published a, an excerpt from a book I'm working on a couple of weeks ago. And I did that, EB, to be honest, because I uh, I didn't do it necessarily for publicity. I didn't do it as a marketing channel, although it's become one very rapidly. I did it because I'm, I'm someone who writes to think like I, I write a thing to think about a thing. Like often I will begin without the idea and I will have written my way to think it through. And when the, when the pandemic really sort of hit home and quarantine hit home, I had not been writing very much. And as a consequence, I hadn't been thinking very much and that was just not acceptable to me. And so I started the newsletter as an accountability measure because I figured if I did this thing and I promised some group of people 
whether it was five or 500 or 5,000, that this is coming on Friday, I better do it. And so that's exactly why I did it. It's an accountability measure and it's been more successful than I, I, than I could have imagined. It also stemmed from a marketing channel that's been extremely effective for Edison and for my, and for me personally has been medium. And I've always published Mm -hmm. really long form things on medium. Like I am not afraid to uncork a a four to 6,000 word article on medium. And honestly, it's been the longer ones that have done better. And as I sort of looked back at all the traffic that medium was getting from that, that was, that was great. But I thought, well, why can't I own some of that for myself? Right? Like why, why does medium get all that? And so I've taken those kind of longer form thought pieces and putting them in a weekly newsletter. And that's, and and that's really the sole outlet for those things. And it's, it's done great. I'm a little overwhelmed by how much content there is to consume, especially, you know, working from home and all you have is you and your laptop and there's so much FOMOC, fear of missing out on content (laughs) for me. So do you have any go-to sources? You're one of mine, but what do you go to? This is something that's taken a, a lot of curation and time. But I have over time, I use a service called Feedly, which lets me aggregate sources of uh, you know, th- back from the days of news readers and, and things like that. And I've a very carefully curated large, but uh, handpicked uh, list of sources that I, that I look through. And interestingly enough, something that's become much more valuable to me, it used to be uh, hugely important to me and especially in building up a brand. And then it kind of went away from me for three or four years. The other thing I'm using a lot more now, I used to use it a lot in the beginning. It was very su- successful and important and then I stopped using it, and now I'm using it again, is Twitter. I find myself spending much more time on Twitter than on Facebook these days. And I think Twitter is important, and it's become more important in in recent years because it's a way to get out of your your filter bubble a little bit. You know, Facebook being sort of confined to people you know and, and, and Twitter being access to experts who you might disagree with. Twitter, I think, has become a lot more important to me, and I'm engaging in conversations there all the time. Yeah, I have to agree with that. And it'll be interesting to see what happens if they move it to a subscription basis. And if that kind of puts us back in our own echo chamber Mm. of, you know, self-selecting voices that you want to hear from and instead of the more diverse possibilities in your timeline. So we'll see what happens with that. So we talked about your wife at the beginning. Let's bookend mm-hmm. with a little bit more at the end of our show. Tell me more about Tamsin and, and what she's doing, because I know you've done some stuff together. So this is just not in a vacuum. Not in a vacuum, no. So my wife, Tamsin, is, first of all, the only Tamsin Webster in the universe. You can Google it. Uh, so <laughs> she's got, she has a very good Google name. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. So that, that's a I good have, one. I have Moss Appeal. And it's all Moss Appeal, except for the hip hop label, which oh, is not me. Yes. Yeah. And unfortunately, with a name like Tom Webster, I, <laughs> I have competition. A Hall of Fame hockey coach, for one. So Tamsin uh, has a, a, an incredible gift for helping people clearly express their big idea in a very persuasive way. And she works on message strategies with companies and organizations and also speakers and authors as a way to take whatever their sort of mess of idea is and turn it into a, a succinct and persuasive and powerful position. And she's also a hell of a speaker. You know, she's a tremendous public speaker and we have been fortunate to speak at a lot of conferences and uh, to just to give a, a plug here for something that we have done together, which we have a tremendous amount of fun doing. We started a podcast for people like the both of us who speak to build our businesses, not, you know, not necessarily like when I speak, I'm not out there trying to build a career as a professional speaker to get, you know, $20,000 keynotes and things like that. I I like what I do and I speak to build what I do. And so I coined a term for people like us, instead of keynoters, we're free noters. We're free noters because we speak for free at like industry things all the time with the hopes of somehow that connecting to building our business. And so we started a podcast together which is called The Free Noter at thefreenoter.com. And we talk about all the aspects of, of how to do that uh, successfully and you know how to sell from the stage without ever selling from the stage and, and losing your soul because nobody likes to hear that. No, but I do love the podcast. And 
I just have to say, I think I like everything you do, Tom. I'm going to come over. How's you need that? To broaden your horizons because because <laughs> I've done some crap, EB. No. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm grateful. I mean, I've had a lot of time and a lot of repetitions doing this, right? I've had the time in my life to be terrible at this and uh, the, the grace from those around me to an encouragement to, to continue to try and get better, which I, which I will do every day of my life. And, and, you know, I think the work that we do at, at Edison is phenomenal. I'm so proud of what my coworkers do. And every time I get on stage, I'm petrified that I'm not going to represent it to the level that, of work that they have put into it. So I take it very seriously. Well, Tom, you have the embroidered baseball cap to prove their affection back for you. I do. A 16-year gift of the Edison baseball hat. It speaks volumes. (laughs) It it does indeed, yes. It speaks volumes. Tom Webster, Senior Vice President of Edison Research, someone that I'd like to call my friend and a terrific guest, as always, because you give good content. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, EB. You're fantastic. Anytime. I'm always delighted when you reach out. Thank you. Well, I hope you got some good inside scoop from this episode of Insider Interviews with me, EB Moss. And I also hope that you'll rate, review, subscribe wherever you download your podcasts. You know the drill. Apple, Stitcher, Google, iHeart. Thanks again for listening.